them. All these field trips are part of the course cost, so they're all covered inside your fee, so you're not asked to, to pay for extra things, though there are undoubtedly extra costs about sort of living or sort of being on a field trip away from Newcastle. What was your experience like and how did that work? Well, we stood in um, what was classed as wigwams, which was sort of little wooden huts in sea houses in uh, Northumberland, which was absolutely fantastic because you could see the Farn Islands and Holy Island, and it was just absolutely beautiful. Um, and what we did is that was all paid for, that was all included, but they had um, fire pits where you could buy wood and things. So obviously go to the local co-op and buy a bottle of wine or a couple of cans of lager because obviously you don't want to get too intoxicated while you're on a field trip. And some wood for a fire pit and some marshmallows. So we had like a proper campfire with marshmallows and wood burn. It was, it was lovely. It was really, really nice. And you did some work. Yes, we did a lot of work. You'd be, you, up on the morning, it's it's almost like working full time. You're up on the morning, you get ready, you get your breakfast, you go a full day in the field and come back and either cook or we got fish and chips from sea houses because you've got to have fish and chips from sea houses. And um, we sort of worked from nine until five for the time that we were there. And then obviously when you come back, you consolidate your learning and you do your assignment and you like to do. It. But the fun aspect is the is sort of added on top of that so it's not just feeling that you're constantly working, you're sort of having that engagement on that on the evening and getting to know the people you're with as well. It's really fun. Really fun. One of the things we often get asked when people are thinking about coming to Newcastle, often from outside because it's how's it gonna work? Where am I going to stay? How's it gonna work? I know you guys didn't necessarily stay in Walter Residence, but you know lots of people who did. Yeah. Is there any recommendations that you can make? It depends on what type of person you are and what you're looking for, pretty much. Um, we've got, I think it was about five or six yeah. halls of residence. And uh, some of them are further out of the city, but they're cheaper. And then you also have ones where you actually get fed as well. So I know a few people who lived in Ricky Road and one person who lived in Hendo, Henderson. Um, she said that she liked it there, it was really good for like, people and things like that, but it was a bit hard to get in because it's quite far out of the city centre, you had to pay for buses. Um, whereas people who lived in Ricky Road, then it was good for a nightlife, but you didn't really get much work done, but it was close at the same time to me, not that many of them took the half the time. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's a few things you just need to consider when you're picking your accommodation. There's probably nearer to 10 or 12 now accommodation sites, but five or six are actually close to campus. Um, so, firstly, is obviously your budget. There's, I'd say, about three tiers. You've got your sort of minimum rates, which is something like Ricky Road, um, or middle rates between 90 to 100, um, things like Maris House and Windsor Terrace, or we've got the upper tier, um, which is your very nice, um, sort of modern, newly refurbished accommodation, uh, ranging from between about 100 to 120, things like Central Link, Liberty Plaza, or Terrace Park, which is a new accommodation, or Castle Court. Um, so again, think of on suite, um, we'll decide what kind of halls you opt for as well. Not all of them are on suite. Um, it's kind of a plus and minus to that. If you are on suite, um, it can be harder to mingle. Obviously, you do have your own bath and shower. You actually get to wash and look after yourself, which is nice. But if you're sharing, then you have a, maybe a bit more of a house share kind of atmosphere. And then after that, it's just the, um, the kind of standard of accommodation. So Ricky Rowe, as you said, it's probably the more basic, but it's also known as the most lively, kind of loudest area. And then the mid range is a little bit nicer. Uh, so then you're in large communities, but you're a bit more secluded in terms of your own flats. And it, I think, Luke, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it, it's possible to apply for your accommodation as soon as you're holding Newcastle this year. Yes, so as soon as you've uh, got your uh, conditional or unconditional offer, you can. You'll be sent emails out, you can click through and put your applications in. Um, there's no immediate rush this year, but the university is doing a new system of application. So it's not first come, first serve. There'll be three waves of allocation, and they'll allocate a proportion of each property in each of that. So even if you're not immediately in there, then you've still got a, you know, a very good chance of getting one of your two options of your accommodation. Um, so don't panic about it, but obviously once you do have that offer, you may as well sort of dive in there and get your application done. 
And there's some really useful stuff online that I like to play with, where you can click on and actually sort of do virtual tours of the different kinds of accommodations. Yeah, so all online there's virtual tours, I think nearly all of them. Um, there's a couple that are being refurbished at the moment, and Park Terrace, the new one, which there aren't any images of, but they can be very nice and just kind of modern um, to funky colours. Um, so go online, and that's at www.ntl.ac.uk slash accommodation. Um, so you can log on there, virtual tools are all over the place. Assessments. <laughs> <laughs> People ask, do we have to do lots of work? How's it going to work? Is everything count? There's all sorts of different kinds of assessment. I think as people who put assessment together as module leaders, we try and make sure there's a variety of different kinds of assessment stuff that's linked to things you'll have to actually do in practice, as well as things that are more like things you've done at school. What kind of sticks in your mind about assessments and how they work? Um, it's good that you get the choice. Like, half, like I'm a very good at exams, so I'm happy that most of my modules are half exams and half coursework. That means that if I don't do very well on an exam, I've still got half my marks from my coursework and I know that I can do well in the coursework. So it's really helpful for me. Um, can, I like doing field trips as well, so field trips are really good because quite a lot of them are assessed, or we do a report after the field work. Then like what you've learned and things like that, so it's really good. I like, um, it's going to sound really strange, but I like doing presentations. Um, it's something that I do tend to sort of do relatively well. It's because I've got experience doing presentations, so that's what I feel comfortable with. When it comes to doing academic writing, that's something that I tend to sort of not do as well as I would like, but it is up to you how well you do because you sort of more sort of encouraged to be responsible for your own learning. So if you want to do really well in the science like Becca does, what you've got to do is put the work in, do all the extra reading, then do it that way. But because the different types of assessment play to different strengths, just because you're not good at one thing doesn't mean to say that it's going to impact on your overall grade. And you get plenty of opportunity to improve as well. Because when I first started, I hated presentations. <laughs> absolutely terrible at them. But recently I've got much better at them, so it's helping a lot doing presentations. Because I know it's not optional to do them, but I know that if I've got to do it, I'll do it well now. So it's really helpful. And we, I think, try, we don't always do it well, and we're uh, trying to give you sort of stages for growing into different things. So as presentations become more important, you've had a chance to practice them where they're not worth so much in your mind, of course. Yeah. Or we do some things that are funny assignments that feel odd because they're practicing learning how to structure an essay or develop a, a piece of work or a report. So we do things, so it's sort of stepping stones on the way. And also building steps where students can actually have their work reviewed and checked if they want to, both by lecturers like me, but also you can engage with people in centrally, there's something called the Writing Development Centre in the library that is a really good resource of mm -hmm. helping students think through how to improve their writing and report writing skills. I must admit, so, uh, looking at the way the course is structured, so the emphasis in first year moves up as you go into second year and third year. That's enabled me to improve as I go along, so it's not as if you're stuck at one academic level. There is improvement, and everybody on the course improves as they go through. Yeah. Non-course related stuff. What do you get up to around studying? I'm sure it doesn't take 24 hours a day to, to achieve the course. So, and you all have lives outside that as well, that aren't related to the course. But are there things that you do, societies or things? That Linked to the course or just linked to the university? Um, there's two societies that are mainly linked to the course the Environmental Society and the, uh, the Soil Society, which has just been formed this year. Um, both of them are really good opportunities that you can get out about. And there's also the Conservation Society, and um, they're much larger than the two societies at the minute, but we're hopefully going to get them all up to numbers and things like that. But um, it's really, all of them provide really good opportunities. You get out of Newcastle, but they're being like in such a good place, you can get to the beach or the countryside, or you can just stay in the city and you can find somewhere in the city and still do with the environment. It's really good. There's also um, different charities that are in the area. So you've got the Northumberland Wildlife Trust, where you can volunteer with them. So it's not just restricted to the courses themselves or the societies within the courses. And there's also a scan as well within the university, which you can do voluntary work with. It depends on your interest, really, to what you can do. But there's societies that cover all types of interests, from skiing 
to the Nature and Conservation Society as well. I think one of the great things, uh, even I still remember being in the slides at university, is that it promotes that sort of getting to know people and getting involved. And you know, it's, it's a little bit about doing conservation work and putting things on the CV, but actually, it's also a lot about just getting to know people, having fun, and having people to hang out with and, and chat things through with, which is really good. Yeah, it's quite, if you come into university and you don't know anybody, it is quite daunting because even though you've probably confident in yourself and what you want to get out of the course and what you want to get out of the university. The fact that meeting new people is a challenge because everybody's different. But with the societies, you do get that opportunity to mix with people who's got the same interest. And what that does is it gives you that bond and to be able to move forward and to sort of get a wide range of friends which will probably stay with you for the rest of your life. And it's possible to be involved in societies for almost anything that you can. So I think there are more than 250 yeah. societies, every kind of sports team that you might imagine, every kind of interest that you might have from, I don't know, Gilbert and Sullivan to Frisbee to whatever. Um, it's possible to get involved in something. So you'll always find someone who's sort of like-minded. It doesn't have to just be course-related stuff. Oh, yeah. And if, I mean, the university is always keen to expand society. So, I mean, if you come with a new interest, you can even set up your own society. There's loads of things to do, um, like I said, lots of sports, both organised, sort of, well, all through the university and officially with the Bucks League, or you can just get a, together with a team of friends and play well with sport you're after, so no, it's quite everything you need. We've had a, an email from Katie Jane who's asking about sort of the additional opportunities around the course, particularly years abroad and, and placements. One of the things that all the second years have to do is, is get involved in a placement opportunity. They have to do 70 hours of work as part of a placement. Because there's actually a module on the course. We think that's in my, and I think that's important to develop a whole range of skills. Do you want to say a little bit about what you're up to on your course? Um, I'm working for Durham County Council and I'm with a contaminated land team. So at the minute, I just started yesterday on my placement. And uh, I'm like, pretty much getting all the old files. One of them was older than me. Um, and I'm putting them onto a computer base, like a database using GIS, which I'll learn about the first year probably. Um, and using that to put it on and working out if the land's contaminated still, or if it isn't, then obviously then they know that when if anyone phones up for a plan application, they can say it's contaminated or it's not. But when they do the other like, research, it hasn't been validated. So it's really interesting, it's helping quite a lot because this is what I want to do when I've finished in uni, so hopefully I'll get there. We, in, in third year, give people the opportunity, and it's something that's, a, that's an optional thing to do, to either take a year out and go into industry or to, to travel abroad. Now, Kirsty's chosen to stay here, but I know you have a colleague who's, who's gone abroad and is making you jealous. Yes, um, one of uh, the girls who's on my course, she's doing the MN the same as myself, and she's actually in the Gill in um, Montreal in Canada at the moment. So she's um, lovely, snow picture scapes on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and she's absolutely loving it. She's got so much support from the university that she's sort of a placement student. Um, but she's also getting the experience outside of that. So she's been on um, a dog sled with huskies and she's been skiing. So yes, it's, I am very jealous but I'm, I'm on the moon for her because she really is having a very good time. And working very hard. Oh, like, very, yeah. very hard. Um, and so the module she's studying abroad counts into her back into her degree year. So she hasn't wasted a year that the study she's been doing abroad at McGill will count towards her, her degree study year, which is really good. Um, Newcastle. <laughs> it's a world of its own, yeah? At least people who don't live in Newcastle think it's a world of its own. And people particularly who might come from a small town are worried about coming to live in a city. What, what kind of advice would you give people? And it is big, it is a big city, but it doesn't feel like it is when you're here. I've lived here all my life, so I might be a bit biased. But um, it's like it's like a little family, pretty much. Like everyone's really, really nice. Like you can't really nice a bunch of people. Even the Jordi Alton's great. You so can't really <laughs> get any more than that. It it probably is quite daunting moving from a small place, but everyone at uni is really nice. There's everyone there to support you, and you've also got other like people around as well who are probably in the same situation as you. So it won't just be you by yourself moving here. It'll be everyone. It'll be very much not in the right place and like not knowing where anything is. But it is a really good city to live in. 
it's not hard to find a way around. I'm from Sunderland, which by comparison to Newcastle is a small city. Well, it's a city now. It used to be a, a small town. So the main shopping centre in Sunderland could literally fit into a very, very small part of Newcastle. But when I was living mainly in Sunderland, I didn't really come through Newcastle very often. So I struggled to find my way around when I first came. But it literally only takes about two weeks to find your way around and then you'd be surprised at how quickly you know where anything is. And if you interact with other sort of people within your sort of course or within your societies or anything like that, you'll find your way around a lot quicker. So it's all about sort of making those connections, sort of getting a, a good circle to support you throughout the transition and anything's possible. What's uh, quite unique about Newcastle is that um, we still have a campus, but and it's right on the edge of the city. So often you visit other places, and they they, they 